We're going to jump into a, a quick kind of panel discussion, but I want to focus it in for each individual. So I'll be asking a question to each one of the panelists here. And maybe from that, if we have some time afterwards, we'll bump into a few questions that might be able to be asked to the panelists. Um, I want to start out, though, and, and say that uh, the last two weeks since we've been on the Origins of Consciousness tour, um, with my friends and colleagues, Dennis and Graham specifically, and Mark's just a touch today, but um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience for all of us. Um, and, and we've learned a lot uh, as well from everybody that we've come in contact with. So I wanted to thank all of you again for coming out. Um, and just being able to kind of open it up, um, having Graham share some personal experiences, but also his expertise and what he's been studying for so long. Um, Dennis is going to share some stuff here in a little while as well and, and a little more personal bend to it. It's, uh, it's important, I think, to have some of that personal aspect to, to kind of help us all empathize and understand that we have an amazing ability to, well, first of all, that we have this conscious ability to, to understand ourselves and even the outward world. And, and I think we need to start exploring that in a, in a more rich and full manner. So I want to thank these guys for being up here with me today. And um, thanks for spending time the last few weeks. It's been absolutely amazing. <laughs> So I'm going to start off with, uh, with Mark here, and um, Mark, some suggest, as, as we've kind of covered a little bit today, that consciousness is everywhere in the universe, and altered states seem to give us or show us the possibility that, that consciousness is a fundamental property of nature, similar to, to physics, for example. Um, I'm curious how we might start to explain an emergent approach to consciousness and its manifestation into matter if it's going that way. And could technology, and maybe specifically the internet, uh, be a representation of the global consciousness? And what does that mean down the road? How long you got? <laughs> as long as you want. No. Yeah. Five minutes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. Squeeze it in. I'm going to start off with uh, my favorite quote from your brother, who said, uh, Scientific American is the most psych psychedelic publication that crosses my desk. Exactly. <laughs> and I was reading uh, an extract from Nature, so one of the preeminent publications in science in the world this morning. And they've discovered something really kind of interesting. I don't know if you've all heard of this idea of the selfish gene, which Richard Dawkins promotes, which is that it's the gene, which is the basic unit, and the gene only exists to make more copies of itself. And all of nature is organized around this. And of course, that's the orthodoxy of Darwinianism. And it turns out, eh, wait a minute, it turns out maybe that not be quite the case. It turns out that it's possible to construct systems of genes that can cooperate with each other. And if you place those into competition with genes that are selfish, they outcompete them, which means that competition is actually a less successful strategy than cooperation is at the genetic level, which means the selfish gene maybe isn't so selfish. I bring this up because cooperation requires awareness. And so at this very foundational level of natural selection, which is really the way things happen, this is the way processes of all sorts happen in the living universe, in order to be successful, in order to select for success, you can't just be selfish. In fact, something will come along eventually tossed up by natural selection, which is using another mechanism which is more cooperative, and that will tend to win over time. And cooperation requires awareness. And so therefore, maybe, and this is just a hypothesis, it would have to be proven, maybe the universe would favor awareness because it fosters cooperation, which then allows systems to thrive and becomes embedded in all processes. So that living processes would tend to be conscious because they would tend to then have a, a mechanism by which they could cooperate. Okay. Let's flash forward four billion years. <laughs> We're now at the point, and I read a second article, in the, which I guess is in The Economist this morning, called Sim Planet. There are now six billion SIM cards in the world. 3.2 billion individuals have a mobile. 3.2 billion, and that all happened pretty much in the last five years. And this means, and I just spent a long time writing a book about this, which you can get online if you just go to nextbillionseconds.com. 
Explaining what happens when everyone gets connected together is basically all of us are now walking around connected to three and a half billion other people, three and a half billion other brains, so that whenever you have a question, you can now turn to a friend with a text message or you can go to Wikipedia. You're not allowed to carry your mobile into a bar for trivia night anymore because when you do, you are implicitly carrying in all of the rest of human knowledge with you, which is new. And so again, now you see this strategy that allows us to connect and to cooperate. But the price you pay for that cooperation is that we're all now sort of working off the same headspace, for lack of a better term. We're all working off the same knowledge space. Now, one of the joys of the internet is that you can find anyone to believe whatever you want because there are going to be a group of people who already have a bulletin board set up to discuss that thing, whatever it might be. So it's easy to find the others. But it's now also incredibly easy to be able to find the truth because you can go connect to the experts who understand what that truth is. That means that we're now functioning inside of a global mind. You don't, you don't have to couch it, you don't have to say it's this or that, it's the other thing. It's a global mind. It's not what we expected. We expected we we're all going to sort of be sucked into some unity. Well, actually, it turns out that's not what happened. It turns out we all started carrying one of these around, and we all do. Australians carry more smartphones around than any other people on the planet. Why? Because when you have this thing, you get everything else. And so that was the deal. It's like, oh yeah, carry this around and you can be part of the global mind. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> Speechless. <laughs> wow. Where's my iPhone? <laughs> Is that a mind blower? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, the universe does seem to be kind of coming, becoming aware of itself in general. Dennis and I have had this conversation before. And, uh, well, you know. I don't know about the universe, but I think the planet is, I mean, the proliferation of these SIM cards and these little devices mm. is the extrusion of the human nervous system into this global net. And right now it runs on phones and SIM cards. There may come a point where, you know, we go to some nanotechnological implementation of this. I mean, what about the iPhone 15, right? What is that one going to look like? I suspect you won't even be able to see it because it'll be... Or you'll swallow it. Right? You'll swallow it, exactly. <laughs> right. It'll be a capsule that you swallow or something you put under your skin. Yep. And then you're just, you know, you're just connected all the time. And it's virtually indistinguishable from telepathy. You look down and to the left and bring it up, and there it is. And when you're done, you put it away, and you're back in consensus reality, or you're back in ordinary, whatever have, that means. I have to tell you, I gave a talk in Melbourne a couple of years ago, and a, 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 sort of a version of this, and a woman came up to me and afterward and said, I cannot wait to have an implant. And I, I looked at her and I said, where's your mobile? She says, it's in my handbag. She, she was carrying her handbag. I said, well, okay, and where, do you, where does it sleep at night? Oh, next to me on the bed. Okay. <laughs> well, because, you know, 75% of people, the mobile sleeps next to them on the bed stand, right? right it's recharging. Right. I said, okay, when is it more than about a meter away from you? She said, when I'm in the shower. And I said, and you need an implant because... <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. You know, exactly. We're already yeah. there. We're already there. We're yeah. already there. And maybe that's what psychedelics are. They're partly learning tools for customizing ourselves to this new information saturated environment that we inhabit. I mean, this is what McLuhan said that's that they right. were tools, they were iterations or prefigurations of electric culture, as he talked about it, which basically means the global internet, the global interconnected village. And it does seem to be that that's what's happening. I mean, it's happened so rapidly that it's almost impossible for us to remember that a mere, what, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, this was just getting started. Now we're all immersed in this global information network 24-7, uh, and we can't imagine doing without it. I mean, I, I, an example, I, I come to Australia and I have a lot of stuff going back, going on back in the States because I'm trying to bring my book out and it's late and there are problems and I need to manage the project and all this. So I come to Australia and it's like I check into the hotel and 
my internet is not working for about four hours, and I'm in this state of total high anxiety. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like having a stroke or something. My God, half my nervous system is not working, yeah. Yeah. you know, and... The exterior half. The exterior half, <laughs> fortunately, right. The, the, I think we all... Yeah, I mean, it was very, very noticeable when we, we, were, we were all staying in this uh, sh shared house up in, up in Byron Bay, you know. We get into the house, and the first thing we do is we all sit down at the table and get out the computers and check out the broadband, you know. What's the router key? <laughs> is, but, the wa is, the, you know, is the wireless working? Is the wireless working? <laughs> Who cares if there's food in the house? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but bad eating. <laughs> but uh, the one, I mean, the one thing I, I would add to this, uh, uh, to just point out, I want to make it, which is, you know, it's per perhaps um, a little bit of a downside to this, is if you look at, at what is obsessing the internet at any particular time, right now it's Gangnam Style, you know. Um, what is it, uh, 455 million views and counting? Um, or Justin Bieber, you know. The, uh, actually, there's an, I mean, wonderful, but there's also, there's a lot of, there's a lot of incredible trivia, mm. which is which is occupying the global synapses. Uh, but through, one man's trivia is another man's, you know, gold. That's the thing too. It's very hard to say this is trivia because it could be absolutely important to someone. When I look at Gundam Style, what I look at is the emergence of Korea as an actual cultural force, and that's brand new. That has not ever happened before really? in history. Really, you see that? I, I absolutely. Yeah. K-pop mm -hmm. is now a thing. So just mm -hmm. as the British invasion happened in the 60s, we're now seeing the Asian music invasion. So that now becomes part of the world culture, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the way it looks. Is, I mean, it's ridiculous because it's a silly video and it's a fun song and it, it, it's meaningless, but it's half a billion people mm. having a shared experience around a culture that is and, not and their do own. Do you think in, in some way that's wakening consciousness up? <laughs> <laughs> Mark Petchy, actually speechless. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to try to frame it as awake or asleep. Mm -hmm. It's a culture that was not in the orbit and has been brought into the orbit, and this is how it's being brought into the orbit. So I think in that, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, walking down the street the other night, coming from a web developer conference, walking by a bar, hearing Gungam style pouring out, I realized that I was living in a William Gibson future because the pop songs were coming from Korea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it had this entire sort of quality to it that actually felt like, yes, this is what the future was supposed to be. This is what we were promised. Fair enough. Well, in there, uh, go on ahead. some level, though, I mean, uh, the, you know, inevitably, then, if we talk about this hyperconnectability and being wired constantly and being implanted, then the dark side of this is the authoritarian side yeah. that they can monitor every thought that we might have, and uh, authoritarian systems being as they are, they want to control. How do we deal with that, Mark? There's, I mean, there's the, the basic sort of premise of uh, Gilmore's Law. So John Gilmore, founder of Sun Microsystems, the internet regards censorship as damage and routes around it. When you have three and a half billion minds connected together, they actually outthink any authoritarian instrument that's applied to them. Now, a lot of our use of connective technologies right now is quite innocent. Uh, our mobiles track every move we make. So Telstra knows where I am pretty much all the time. Uh, and because that's the way we design these devices. So we actually do need to start thinking about designing these devices in a way that provide as much obscurity as they do connectivity. And that's the next place we have to go to. To the degree we don't do that, they can become instruments of authoritarianism. Right. Yeah. And I, th I, I think, I mean, just reflecting on our exchange a moment ago, I, I, I also think they can become instruments of shutting consciousness down mm. on a mass scale. I, I, I do think you know, that this is an incredibly powerful tool for liberation. Um, and I, I, I see its effects everywhere, but, but uh, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it, 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 it also has um, uh, a shutdown If things can happen on that huge scale globally, instantly across the world, bad stuff can happen as well as good stuff. Yeah, That's but what I'm let me back you up on this, because when you guys were just talking about the fact that you had the net down for four hours when you were in Byron and you went bananas, that's actually a withdrawal symptom. Mm. <laughs> One of the things that happened to us was we made such an instantaneous leap between disconnected and connected culture, we just sort of forgot about the fact that 
disconnected culture is really kind of good for you because the soul nurtures itself in silence. Yeah. Right? Connectivity is really good too, but we've forgotten that all that disconnected time we had before that was really important because it was all we ever had. Right. And we've sort of thrown a baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, yeah, and I think yeah. that is actually more than any other perceived threat. The immediate threat to our sort of central sense of well-being is the thing that we have to claw back. No silence. No silence. I remember, uh, I remember the time, you know, before the internet and before the computer revolution, I'm, you know, well old enough to remember that, when uh, everybody was saying, you know, we're going to have these computers and we're all going to, it's going to liberate us. Mm -hmm. We're going to have so much more free time. Mm -hmm. Everything is going to be, we're just, we're not going to know. We're going to have so much free time. We're not going to know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And actually the opposite has been the it's case. The it's overwhelmed <laughs> every area of our lives. We're never unplugged. But it's not the computer that's done that. No. It's, it's the demands from all the people that Ab we're connected to. Absolutely. Uh -huh. yeah. So well, we've done it to ourselves. We've done it to ourselves. It's oh. self-inflicted, uh, um, and it's the other side of the coin. Yeah. yeah. Graham, maybe you could uh, take that a bit further. I mean, you asked if it was doing the awakening. <clears throat> Um, because we now have this potential to share this information and to come up with these new ideas and see new relationships through all this technology, <clears throat> I'm wondering if you know, we are like our ancestors sitting at the cave walls, except they're digital at this point, and how are we starting to share that information to make a difference? Mm. Um, and do you see a way that we can do that? Well, I think it, I think it, is, it is happening uh, all the time, um, and, and sometimes it isn't Justin Bieber and Gangnam style, you know. Sometimes it is the Arab Spring. Sometimes it is Occupy Wall Street. Sometimes things that really are making a difference and, and, and changing negative structures are coalescing mm. uh, around the facilities that the internet makes, uh, makes available. Uh, so like everything else, um, you know, it's our, it's our choice what we can do with it. I know as a researcher um, that operations that took me weeks or months in the 1980s uh, take me minutes now. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's, yeah. that's an incredible enhancement of, of, of one's, one's power to investigate and dig deep and find, and find stuff out. I mean, it's just amazing mm -hmm. that, it's, that it's there. Uh, and this, you know, so I feel ultimately the tool can be used for negative and it can be used for good, but, but the tool itself is a wonderful, wonderful asset. To the, to the human race, and it's up to us to, to make the right choices. And yes, new forms of creativity are emerging, and, and uh, with them, new forms of communication. Goodness knows where it's going to go, go yeah. next, but yeah, this is the cave wall. It is, yeah. The virtual yeah, yeah. cave wall. Well, and, uh, and I, <clears throat> since my reintroduction to psychedelics a decade ago, um, DMT was still pretty obscure at that time, yeah. and it was a psychedelic lore, and that's changed over the last five, even two or three years. Hugely. Pretty dramatically. And a lot of that, I think, is because of the internet. Mm -hmm. and, and specifically, I was talking to someone about this earlier, the DMT, the spirit molecule, the film, mm -hmm. is on Netflix in yeah. America, <laughs> which means yeah. that the, the one third of Americans who have a Netflix subscription, and Netflix is so big that one third of the American internet after 8 p.m. is Netflix. All right, right, that's how big it is. Wow. And so there's now this entire subculture of young people who really didn't know anything about DMT who are watching this film and telling their friends. And so this film is getting millions of views now and there's a DMT renaissance happening because of that. It's not my fault. I swear <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> it's not your fault. <laughs> um, well, maybe I'm gonna try to take this back and Dennis, I'm gonna throw this out at you. Um, What, what is the role of this entheogenic spirituality and maybe some practical steps um, that we can do to kind of help build this bridge between our modern culture and a lot of these, you know, ancient cultures or indigenous cultures that have had this knowledge? And what, what is it there that's happening and how can we actually see some of those things, you know, unfold? Um, and how do we look back at those and pull them into a modern culture? Well, you know, that's a huge, that's a huge area and I don't know. I mean, I think what we're seeing is this inevitable process when one culture reaches out and contacts another. And usually it's the dominant culture, uh, you know, the modern Western culture, you know, uh, has always basically these, these less stable, less, I don't know what the term is, um, less, uh, less westernized cultures. You know, Western culture has come in and taken what it wants and pretty much left devastation in its wake. 
uh, you know, we see this, uh, you know, Western civilization is a history of biopiracy. It's nothing new. You know, we stole most of our food plants, most of our medicinal plants from the New World, you know, and took it back to Europe. And, you know, and the New World fought back in a certain sense in that what did we take? We took tobacco, you know, even though when Columbus arrived in Hispaniola, the first thing that he encountered was cohoba snuff, was DMT snuff, you know, but that wasn't dramatic, right? I mean, so I've often wondered how would the course of civilization have gone after the Columbian exchange if they had brought back cohoba DMT <laughs> snuff to England and then that had diffused throughout Europe instead of tobacco. But tobacco was so dramatic, this act of drinking smoke, as they called it, and they just couldn't ignore that. And so they brought tobacco back and look where we're at. So maybe that's the indigenous people's revenge in a certain sense. You know, they've given us, you know, cancer, cancerous tobacco-related diseases. So, I mean, it's an inevitable process that we're going to borrow or steal or take whatever we want from these indigenous cultures. One, one would hope that if, as we learn the kind of the ethical uh, compass of using psychedelics, we'll learn to honor these cultures a little more than, than has been the past in, in history. And, uh, you know, perhaps, uh, I mean, it's such a complicated thing. Ayahuasca tourism is definitely changing traditional ayahuasca use. But you have to ask yourself, if there wasn't ayahuasca tourism, would, would the tradition even survive? You know, ayahuasca tourism has given it new life. Uh, you know, indigenous people, or, or more accurately, probably mestizo people, now have an economic uh, means uh, that they didn't have before. Uh, now, some have cashed in, and that's, that's capitalism, that's the free market. Others approach it more sincerely. I think most people who go to South America to seek ayahuasca do so sincerely. These are not, by and large, thrill seekers. These are serious people who want a spiritual experience, largely because Western culture and, and organized religion no longer offers that. These are hollowed out. Uh, institutions that offer their institutions of control. Religions are not religious institutions anymore, they're political institutions. They're about controlling behavior. People want to step outside of that and have a genuine mystical experience, a genuine encounter with the Mysterium Tremendum. But there are hazards with that. You know, they go to another culture and if they're lucky, they get a genuine experiment, experience, everyone goes home happy. If not, things can go off track easily. How this is going to play out in the next 20 years, I don't know. I mean, but it is going to play out inevitably. It will play out some way. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, well, Graham, we've called this tour the Origins of Consciousness. I don't think we've figured that out or answered that question, nor do I think we, we may never know what that is. But we've poked around a little bit, um, looked at w whether that be cave art or just certain representations or the development of this emergent process of, of consciousness. I'm curious what your thoughts are on people being able to pull this back on a personal level and starting to do things and ask questions about their own consciousness mm -hmm. to make a difference in the world. Well, <coughs> um, I think uh, the the notion of making a difference in the world um, as an individual is is formidable. Uh, the world seems too big. Um, the political institutions, the economic institutions, the huge corporations, big pharma, uh, the states, all, all of that out there, and all of what it's doing in the world seems too big to handle. Uh, as individuals, we, we feel conf powerless in the face of that. I, I do. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, I look in despair at things that are happening in the world, and, and I wish they were otherwise. Uh, but I, I don't know a way to make them otherwise. Um, what I do know uh, is a way to make my impact on those I touch in my life 
better rather than worse. Uh, that's that. I would say that is my goal. The people, who, the people who are close to me in my life, and the people who I encounter in in daily life, that as far as possible, I'm human. I'm frail. I have my bad moods. I I misbehave. But as far as possible, uh, I should try to be a nurturing and positive presence rather than a negative and harmful and grasping presence. Yeah. Um, and and that's an area where I do actually have some control and some personal power on how I act on those around me. So that's what I'm watching and that's what I'm monitoring and that's what any of us can do um, is to live consciously and, and to try to be uh, an, an agent for nurture and, and, f and for love in our immediate surroundings as far as, as it is possible within the bounds of human frailty. And I think if we all do that, actually, uh, it's going to spread. It's going to, be, it's going to be a good thing. It's going to be a great thing for, the so for society and for the world. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, beyond that, I, I cannot say, I cannot reach. I think you nailed it. I, I mean, for me personally, what I've noticed <clears throat> through my own work is, is doing that, you know, paying attention to, to myself, but how that's affecting others. Mm. Um, and if we look at the internet as an example, then I think we could, it does start to influence people around us. Sure. It influences our relationships, it influences our work, it influences all sorts of aspects of our life, and that does start to splinter off, and it does make a difference, and if we're making differences in other people's lives from an individual perspective, then that can affect the next person, and the next person, and the next person, mm -hmm. so. Um, I don't know, we've thrown a lot out here really quick, but I wanna open it up to maybe a few questions before we have uh, Dennis, all right, we got some quick hands. Quick. We have some microphones that, that we could uh, pass around. Uh, my question is for Mr. Hancock. Um, the whole purpose of this is for the origins of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, you once said on an interview that um, um, consciousness is just uh, a natural force like gravity. And uh, when you said that, I then had another, I asked myself the question of who created that? And um, I, I don't know the answer, but you have much more uh, knowledge than I do. So I would like to ask you if you can speak. The, on, the only knowledge I have is of the vast, huge, abyssal, massive amount that I do not know. That's all. <laughs> I honestly, I hey, don't know. Hey, that's a I just, start. I just feel myself confronted by mystery uh, okay. ev everywhere. I honestly do not know uh, any, any answers to that. Okay. It recedes endlessly into the distance. Okay. What was it? Was it created? Uh, was it always there? What, what part does consciousness play in it? Yes, I do feel instinctively consciousness is one of the fundamental forces in the universe, perhaps the fundamental force uh, to which everything else is, is secondary, but I can't prove that. Uh, and, and, and there are no answers, you know, we just have this life and we have to learn as much as we can and, and come to certain conclusions. But, but uh, the unknown, I think, is always going to exceed the known. Um, I, I, at a personal level and, and, and at the level of the species. Just one last I question, sorry. Uh, you, you also said that um, our ancestors were told um, when, uh, like, uh, the Ark of Noel, he was given a warning that the floods were going to come. So now with the whole 2012 thing, I, I'm very optimistic, but have the, uh, have the spirits given anyone some sort of warning? That would be my um, well, certainly not me. I, I, um, I, I feel very optimistic. Uh, I, I do think it is a, a dangerous and troubled time that we live in. I do think humanity is the greatest threat to ourselves, not some blind geological disaster, uh, but, but the terrible thing that we can do to ourselves, you know, the hundred nuclear warheads in the hands of the state of Israel, the hundred nuclear warheads in Pakistan, the nuclear warheads in India, the nuclear warheads in the United States, China, France, you know, this, this is Russia, I mean, th this is a terrible p poison disaster that, that we have embraced and cultivated as a, as a global culture, and it is worrying, uh, extremely so. Um, but I do feel perhaps almost an irrational sense of joy and optimism that somehow we are going to get through this and we are going to make things better because we can choose as human beings and we can choose the right rather than the wrong. Yeah. Yes, and I think, I think the point that Graham makes about the, the proliferation 
of these nuclear weapons. I mean, those, you know, that's an illustration of how irrelevant and really silly the international geopolitical conversation is. There's all this anxiety about that Iran might end up with a nuclear weapon, and that would be terrible. That would totally destabilize global geopolitics, and nobody is allowed to talk about the fact that Israel has a hundred nuclear weapons and has had for years. And if Iran gets a nuclear weapon and uses it on Israel, they'd have to be absolutely insane because Israel will turn that country and the entire Middle East and probably the world into a sea of fire. Mm. So, you know, why isn't this being talked about on the, on the political stage? The, the, the conversation shouldn't be whether Iran gets a nuclear weapon. The conversation should be why aren't we as a global culture getting together to ban all nuclear weapons everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. We have to get past that, <laughs> that bottleneck. Let's move on to another question. We only have time for a few more. G'day. Um, I'd like to ask, in terms of collective consciousness um, and understanding that when we smoke the DMT, we're interacting with real or potentially real entities that gives more credence to writings that are like you know channeled writings and as such have you guys taken any time to look into say work to do with say the flower of life and things of that nature that give a clear picture of the whole purpose behind the pyramids being built and how to actually create your own artificial Merkaba, which you see referenced in the in the shamanic drawings that the shamans draw with the astral bodies that they that allow them to travel around. Just hearing all you guys talk, everything comes down and is referenced in the channeled writings before it's actually discovered and, and proven in the scientific realm. Just wondering what you guys think about that. I don't know if I quite understand the question. If you could, do you, you guys grab that? You wanna take a stab at this or? Well, I think what you're, if I get you right, what you're saying is that there is this phenomenon of, of channeling, that people have mm. been ch channeling entities, mm. sometimes construed as aliens, sometimes construed as, as spirit beings, and that they've been sending messages to us. And there's a, there's a tendency for, very pronounced tendency for mainstream science to dismiss and reject and ridicule that kind of information. Um, I, I would say uh, that it should be ranked alongside other information as worthy of worthy of inquiry and, and, and listening to. But but like any other field, the, the channeling field has some very genuine individuals in it, and it has some true charlatans in it <laughs> as well. So, you know, you have to be careful. Yeah. All these people have temporal lobe epilepsy. <laughs> <laughs> but not necessarily a bad thing. But you know. Yes, um, it's been touched on today so far as the project to promote like the growth of consciousness and everything and that there are forces that can act against that and um, the war on drugs has been mentioned but um, it always sticks with me sort of uh, big pharma and um, sort of antidepressants and all mm. this. How do you guys view um, what seems to me in some cases like political motivations to... I promote the, the spread of those sorts of Terrible, things. terrible problem. I, I, I detest antidepressants. I think they're, I think they're a dreadful thing. Um, and I speak from experience, having spent uh, five years of my life on antidepressants, SSRI antidepressants, Siroxat and Prozac, and having found myself un unbelievably, for the first time in my life, having suicidal thoughts when I tried to get off Siroxat. Uh, it, it was very difficult. I did get off it, and, and uh, this was long before I encountered ayahuasca, uh, long years before, but, uh, but I regard my, uh, my episode with antidepressants as one of the darkest episodes of my life, and far from helping me, they, they were very, very, very harmful and negative to me. And I think I detest the way that Big Pharma is, is in the business of inventing ailments, so-called psychological ailments, and then providing the pill to cure that invented ailment. Um, and, and at the same time is hand, in, is hand in glove with the forces that are denying us the right to use ancient and sacred plants that have been part of a, 
of human culture for thousands of years and that are tried and tested in the field for thousands of years and that are known to be beneficial and helpful. It's a very negative thing, this, uh, this, this business. And I would say, I would say for anybody facing, facing depression, the very last thing you should do is get on to antidepressants. Uh, I think the thing we want to say is that antidepressants are massively overprescribed. Absolutely. But not that they're not necessary for certain people. Right. And, and, and it's very, very hard, I think, for us to make any blanket statements around that. Yeah, no, no, that's what I'm saying. I mean, they're, they're, they're massively overscribed, particularly for children. It's clear that they're counterindicated for children, right? Right. Um, and I think we have to take a look at the culture of overprescription around them that's sort of walked us into that, because then we'll be able to walk out into what would be probably effective use, but will not yield, you know, huge bumper quarters for Eli Lilly or whoever. And that's, in a sense, it's more probably a capitalist motive that's led to the overprescription than anything else. Uh, there's a, a book now that's just come out. Is it called Bad Pharma? It's called Bad Pharma. It's just been published. And it lays out in very precise terms, a journalist, um, the precise relationships between the scientific peer review bodies, the drug companies, and the prescribing physicians, and the government agencies, and how essentially there's become, uh, what's the opposite of a virtuous cycle? A vicious cycle. There you go. <laughs> it's become a vicious cycle of feedbacks, in, which is then leading to um, this overprescription. I think one of the best, um, yeah, uh, I was just going to say, one, I think one of the best prescriptions that we can do, and, and this isn't going to change everything right away, but simply by eating natural foods and a bit of exercise, that takes a lot of that out of the equation altogether. Yeah. Almost immediately. Um, and that should start within families and within children because that, that changes and, and sets up a new model for our young people. It makes a big difference. So. I, I think that, uh, I mean, I, I feel compelled to say this. I think that this, uh, this is a topic that, you know, we could easily spend the rest of the night on, and it's, it's very important. I think that what we're seeing now, this, this, uh, these entrenched, what you might call the psychopharmaceutical industrial complex, biomedical industrial complex, may have been something that originally arose out of benign motives, but has gone completely out of control. And what we're looking at now, I mean, we talk about the war on drugs, right? And the war to suppress these psychedelics and other substances in that realm, which are outside of this biopharmaceutical industrial complex, but you can also talk about the war of drugs. Drugs are being used to chemically re-engineer the personalities of entire populations and entire generations. You know, the students I have taught in my experience in the last 10 or 12 years, 40 to 50 percent of them come out of high school they're on a drug of some sort, Adderall or Ritalin or antidepressants or sometimes even more draconian drugs like the so-called atypical antipsychotics, sometimes cocktails of these things because they don't fit within a behavioral, an, an expected behavioral uh, set of parameters. Maybe they're a little bit excitable or they're, you know, and, and medicine is, stacked against them, you know, they, they go to a doctor, the doctor has five minutes to look at a patient you know, because of the, the way the costs are structured and everything, five minutes, ten minutes if you're lucky. So they assess you and then they say, okay, you know, here's a prescription for, you know, the antidepressant of the week, whatever's new this week, you'll, we'll get you on that. I mean, it's criminal, this is criminal is the use of these psychopharmaceuticals to re-engineer personality. You know, we're in the brave new world. I mean, Huxley envisioned all this, mm -hmm. right? Soma was the, uh, in Huxley's vision, it was much simpler. It was like Soma was kind of the all-purpose drug. 
And, uh, you know, and at low doses, it was kind of an anxiolytic and kind of a euphoric thing, and it was recreational at higher doses. You could use it for spiritual purposes, but it was all the same drug. And the motto of the day was, a gram is better than a damn. You know, you can, I mean, you should never feel sad or depressed or, you know, a manic or anything. You just want to maintain this, you know, this sort of even demeanor, and you can control it with this with this miracle drug, Soma, that everyone takes. And if you don't take it, you're, you know, there's something wrong with you. Well, we have essentially that situation, except instead of having one drug, we have dozens of drugs that the biomedical, pharmaceutical, industrial complex wants to prescribe to us for our own good, as they see it. Well, who decides what's for our own good? You know, I don't want this. I reject it. This is another thing. We have to realize these plants, these substances are our weapons. If we are advocates of consciousness, we have to use, we have to deploy these weapons wisely and carefully because this is what we have to fight back from all that crap out there. Thank you, Dennis. I think we have time for one more quick question. Uh, Hi, guys. I'm asking you this as... Our elders, you, um, you've, you've been around, you know a lot about this stuff, and we're talking about the war on some drugs, um, the war of some drugs. How can we as little people, you know, whatever profession we're in, what we do in our day-to-day lives, how can we work towards um, a Portugal model? Um, how, what, how do we get there? What? what can we... What model, I'm sorry? A model of uh, what Portugal looks like now. Portugal, in their, their laws, their, yeah. How, what, what can we do? How? C- condemn and refuse to vote for any politician who doesn't take a, 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 an open stance on this. If a po- I would say if a politician is for the war on drugs, that person should never get a vote, and we should talk to, we should talk to others and, and, and persuade them that it's not right to vote for that person, no matter what his other policies are. Um, make, it, make it unattractive for politicians to vote for the maintenance of the status quo, make them feel that their jobs are in danger if they do that, that we as a community and, and, and global youth is angry about this and, and will not support them. They will not be re-elected. They will not get a job unless they take a firm, a firm line on at least moving towards the Portugal model. And the Portugal model is, I mean, a fascinating mm-hmm. experiment, as a matter of fact, where all drugs have been decriminalized and all the doomy predictions of the end of the world and the collapse of Portuguese society have turned out to be completely false. And actually, the uses of many drugs have fallen rather than risen since that, since that happened. This is all you have to do. You just have to trust right. the people right. and give them free choice, and they will actually make the right just decisions. People can regulate the themselves. Exactly. They can take responsibility for themselves. And, and I think part of the solution is, really, we have to displo- deploy these sacred substances in defense of, uh, you know, as a defense against this global agenda of mind control. And one way you do that, I think, being a botanist and an ethnobotanist, I think you use the plants. Those are very effective. And, you know, they're natural, and you just share that knowledge and share those plants with your neighbors. Grow a garden and give them to your next-door neighbor over the back fence. Eventually, (laughs) this will proliferate. Look what's happened with ayahuasca in the last 25 years. 30 years, you know, confined to the Amazon, it's now global, and it's changing the world. So that's, that's one solution. But again, it doesn't happen overnight, but it happens fast. Um, politicians are, uh, I'll be polite, they're essentially cowardly. Yes. And <laughs> the way to move them, uh, you, know, you had to say the word Portugal a couple of times because we couldn't hear it, but it was also because we weren't quite tuned to it. And I think part of what I, I really see about this is that everyone in this room may be familiar with what's going on in Portugal. I don't think everyone in Kensington or in Sydney or in New South Wales or in Australia are. Maybe what we should be doing is sharing that story. <coughs> because then it allows them to reframe what their expectations are, because all they've ever been taught is that a free drug society is chaos. Mm -hmm. 
And we go, oh, actually, no, it's not. We've got one over here, and it seems to be running just fine. In fact, the incidence of drug use is down. And if we go with that message, then the next time a politician blusters, they actually get laughed at, which they hate more than anything else, and it moves them. I want to thank the panelists. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Mark. Um, thanks again to you guys. And trust me, you're in for a treat. Enjoy. Do you guys mind if I take a picture of you for my mom? Cool. Could you just put your hands up for me and say hi? Awesome. Thank you. She'll be happy. <laughs>